Well, welcome to another episode of the Tech Transfer Podcast at BYU. I'm here with Brian Bentley, who's one of our great founders of a startup. Uh, Brian, do you want to introduce yourself for a second and, and tell us about how you got started with Tech Transfer? Yeah, uh, Brian Bentley with Diagnostic Ventures. Uh, we have a different name with the university, but that's the public name we go through in the industry. And we have a funny story about how we started with Tech Transfer. So me and my partner, uh, Bill Michaels, um, we had a software company that was designed to help doctors and dentists perform task management, make sure the office runs smooth. And while we were looking to get that off the ground and going, we had access to COVID kits. And my partner, Bill, thought, I went to BYU. I'll sell BYU COVID kits that we were getting from um, Asia, and that will help fund our business. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so he went in, and somehow he ended up in Mike Alder's office. And I think Mike had another appointment with somebody. And when he came in and talked about COVID kits, he says, oh, so you're here to talk about our COVID kit technology that a professor, you know, was promoting. Right. And he goes, what? And anyways, you know, he rolled with it. And um, it was interesting technology. It actually didn't pan out. But Mike and Bill started a relationship and I think we've licensed one, uh, let's see. So let's see, three, four, and so three more technologies from BYU. I'll probably talk about two of them here on, on the, uh, the podcast here, but um, Mike, wonderful guy, your predecessor, mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. um, wonderful guy. He's helped us and, you know, introduced us to some people. So, that's how we got involved, uh, you know, with the tech transfer office. In fact, this is an answer to a later question, but if I were to start my career, I would go around to tech transfer offices at different universities, find out, you know, exciting technology and try and take those to market. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a wealth of opportunities if you know how to develop things. Yeah, Mike would always refer to as low hanging fruit at universities. These are, these are things where maybe millions of dollars have been put into some technology and they're yeah. mostly not being marketed too hard. So at, at most universities, so uh, it's some great opportunities there. And just so, I don't know if you know, Brian, Mike is running the mentorship program over at iHub, which is the new accelerator from Corbin Church now. So he's retired from oh, BYU, but he's- I didn't know that. Out talking and helping up startups, which is great. So, well, good. so prior to Bill Michaels wandering into Mike's office, did either of you really know that the tech transfer industry existed? Um, no, yeah. I, you know, it doesn't surprise me, but no, I didn't really know that it was a source for business opportunities. So yeah. no, it totally surprised me. And as I've been around it, it's like, you know, I've seen some amazing stuff when we acquired a couple of them that we're very excited about. Yeah. And there are things we use all the time. Like Google came out of Stanford from tech transfer, many pharmaceuticals, but it is not something a lot of people have really thought through a lot. So yeah, we're great. So, um, so diagnostic ventures deal specifically with sepsis, and then these other ventures have some other technologies. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the problems you're working on? Yeah. So, um, the sepsis technology that we we acquired out of BYU uh, is amazing. I think uh, Dr. Pitt and Dr. Robinson should be up for a, a Nobel Peace Prize in medicine um, because of really how dynamic it changes it. So. Basically, sepsis is a worldwide problem. 50 million people get it worldwide. Uh, over 11 million people die from it. Uh, in the U.S., it's a huge problem as well. Um, a million 700,000 people acquire it, 350,000 die. Um, you're more likely in the United States to get sepsis and or die from it than you are from having a heart attack or stroke combined. Most people don't realize how prevalent it is but it's a serious issue. And so the current standard is when you present at a hospital with, you know, fever and different things, they don't know it's sepsis. And so if it's looking bad enough, they'll pull some blood out of your, your body and then give you broad spectrum antibiotics. And they'll run a blood culture on that uh, blood samples. It takes 12 to 48 hours or longer to get results. And so the doctor's basically flying blind and not knowing 
really what's causing the infection in the patient. They just hope they gave them the right antibiotics. And about a third of the time, it's not correct. Um, and so the technology that Dr. Pitt and Robinson developed uh, from a grant from the NIH for 5 million was to um, look at doing a test differently. They said, you can't use a PCR with blood because there's too many things in it. And so um, Dr. Um, Pitt, you know, he's a chemical engineer and he's, you know, I'll look at this a different, in a thousand different ways. And so he actually thought of separating the blood. And um, I've got a sample here. Oh, nice. Should have had it out, but. Um, and while you're looking for that, can I ask you, Brian, how do people get sepsis? Like I have some ideas, but they're, they're probably wrong. Yeah. And all right. Maybe I didn't put it in there. All right. So basically sepsis is caused by bloodstream infection. You can get it from uh, pneumonia is the number one cause of sepsis, diarrhea, um, UTI, um, hospital acquired infection, you know, a cut on your skin and a bacteria gets in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, those are the main causes. Um, it can be, you know, come up because of other health concerns. So I have a friend that lives nearby, has cancer, been fighting it for a couple of years. And last weekend he had a fever. Um, mm -hmm. He had an infection, he had a UTI. Um, he had some mental, you know, he wasn't all there. And then he was in extreme pain. And that's the acronyms for time, T-I-M-E. Those are things. And so his wife fortunately got him into the doctors real quick. Gave man antibiotics for UTI, and now he's recovering. But he had the beginning signs of sepsis, and a lot of people aren't aware of it. So part of our process to get this to market is also uh, make people aware of what the symptoms of sepsis are and how to get proper treatment. And so, so when, when you and – oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yep. when you and Bill co-founded the company, had you had experience with someone getting sepsis, or was this a new thing? You, you know, I hadn't, um, but – I'm a little nerdy in that when I get involved with something, I really seek to understand it, you know, from beginning to end. And so I started looking into it and then I saw how big of an issue it was. I'd heard a little bit about it. Um, but then, you know, when I've been at events and presenting our company, I'll ask the crowd, how many peer have you have had sepsis or know somebody's? And 50% of the hands go up. And then afterwards, people come up and tell me their stories. And it's like really, you know, emotional. Like I almost lost my pregnant wife. Um, I lost my parent. And um, so I, I learned quickly about it. And I really feel motivated to get this out there. I, I feel a driving force that it, we need to get it out there to help people. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, that could be benefited from this. Uh, statistics show that if a doctor is given the right diagnosis within one to three hours, then 80% of those patients should live instead mm -hmm. of 11 million potentially dying. So that's a big number. And we're in that sweet spot right now. We're at an hour and a half with a partnership. We're uh, discussing, I'll be meeting with the company tomorrow. Um, we might get that closer to an hour. So that's even a better win for the patient and the doctors. You know, and non-technical people like me who aren't involved in the company, like I'm thinking, well, wow, I hope you saw this quickly and get it out to market. If someone wants to actively participate, are you raising funds or anything or what could someone do, do to help? Yeah, we are currently raising funds. We did a, a you know, I self-funded for a while. We got a little angel amount of money a month or so ago, but yeah, we're actively raising. We're looking for about 3 million. We've recently uh, applied for a ARPA H broad agency announcement um, to get funding to develop and take it to market. So hopefully in the next two, three weeks, we'll hear if we're invited to do the full proposal. Um, but yeah, that would be huge. So I don't know if I explained actually how it works. So sure. the spinning disc, um, instead of using a centrifuge, Dr. Pitt, thought of putting blood in the center of this disc, spinning it uh, in about less than a minute up to a certain speed. And he used sedimentary and density 
um, in his calculations. And basically the red and white blood cells go to the right, the plasma and the pathogens go to the left, and then we slow it down and it comes into the center of the disc and we pipette it out and then we do some other stuff with it. So that's really groundbreaking. And then Dr. Robinson is developing the multiplex or pentaplex assays where we can run it in a PCR because uh, NIH says you can't run this in a PCR because there's too much interferences. There's 5 billion, 500 million particles in it, one ml of blood, and we're looking for four to 10 particles. And, and the reason there are so few, you're looking for so few particles because you're testing so early in the infection, hopefully, right? Um, yeah, but they're, you know, they start showing some signs. So, but yeah, the lower level of detection, the better, and the doctors love that. And the fact that we can say it's gram positive and it's E. coli, or I might have gotten that backwards, um, yeah. or gram negative mm -hmm. and Klebsiella or something like that, the doctor, that's information that he can use to start treating correctly the patient and maybe not have antimicrobial resistance develop in the patient because they're given broad spectrum mm -hmm. uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And let me back up a little bit. So Brian, you had, you've had a career where you've been in kind of these executive positions in large companies. And then here you've gone uh, with a startup company. What was that transition like and what, what made you make the move? Um, it, it was kind of, so my partner, Bill, we had started a software company um, and we got the technology from BYU. He develops cancer. He had um, prostate cancer. And he went through some treatment and it looked like he got through it well. Uh, we were still moving forward. And then he got bladder cancer. And so uh, a little after we had acquired the sepsis technology, two, three months, he ended up passing away. And it was a shock to us. Um, but I promised his wife that I'd watch out for their interest. And so, um, you know, you have a partner and, you know, sometimes you're thinking, okay, he's got it and I'll just help as I can. And then it's like, well, yeah. I'm in charge. So um, life sometimes throw you curves and I think that's how we grow and develop uh, our ability. So yeah, I've, I've been in an injection molding. I've been in sterilization. I used to sell lab equipment to universities. So I feel like I've been around this industry and then when it was presented to me, I was like, oh, I know how those things are made. I know how to get it sterilized. You know, I'm familiar with labs, how things work. Um, so, you know, to some degrees, I felt like I was ready to handle this um, this challenge and, and go from run, working with large companies and running my own with some really good uh, support. Yeah, you do seem uniquely matched to the opportunity. Um, I enjoyed my interactions with Bill. He was great and very committed to this, and it's it's great that you can carry that on. What what kinds of challenges are you running into, or have you run into so far? Uh, besides Bill passing, um, you know, part of it is, and it wasn't too bad of a challenge. Just understanding the industry and also uh, the med tech industry, and also the sepsis market, and so finding out who the competitors are, and I do a deep dive and really understand it, and. Um, that was a little cha challenge. Um, finding, um, you know, uh, one, I couldn't have done this without Devin Connor, my partner. Um, he's with us at like two companies before with Bill and I, and then the next company with Bill and I, and he's here and he's really good and really helpful. Uh, so we've been introduced to, um, you know, different people in the industry. We've got, we joined Bio Utah. Uh, we go to all their events. They had one down at BYU to introduce them to BYU, which hopefully has been good for you guys. Yeah, it's been great. Um, and it's like making connections, uh, understanding the players. Uh, one thing that happened was, so we had Xenon HS3 and 4 that Bill was a partner of. And he had a partner that kind of left him in the dust, but he didn't like deal with that person and break the the agreement and relationships. And so Bill passed and it's like, Bill said, I have half of those companies, but legally I didn't. And so it's like, what do I do? Right. And, you know, I tried to talk to the person and they acted like, you know, they never did anything wrong. 
and I didn't know how to handle it. So I did a couple of things. One was ask them for funds to keep funding the program. But then through another source, I was led to, I was looking up some stuff about PCRs and found out this other guy who knew her found out on a deal that they were involved in together business-wise where they were importing COVID kits mm -hmm. that, it, that she had ripped them off. And part of our agreements in those companies were fraud. You commit fraud, you're out. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big challenge because I was trying to move forward with the technology with Dr. Hill. And then it came up like, well, it's time to get worldwide patents. Do you want them? And it's like, uh, I don't have the money right now, but I think I should. And so, you know, we instructed uh, the, your uh, IP attorneys to go ahead and file those for us. And we got in certain countries that I think will be very beneficial to all. But that was a challenge and a worry is like, is it all going to come together? Um, there was a time also where you're looking at competitors and there was a competitor that came out with some technology that could in like 20 minutes, you know, take from a sample from blood, uh, extract DNA and uh, tell you what it was in 20 minutes for like $20. And I thought, oh no. I mean, I'm happy yeah. that the world might be benefited, sure. but it's like, I've got this technology that might not work. And it's like, oh no. Um, so I went and talked to this guy who started the company, the CEO at an event and said, I admire what you're doing. And, you know, I'd love to see if there's anything we can do together. And it turns out that, um, they can only do like four or five items at a time pathogens. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they weren't looking at the sepsis market. We're looking at 35, 40 targets and they would have to do multiple, uh, pieces of their test which gets up there in money. So it didn't work out. But as it turns out, they have an extraction device, a piece of their uh, technology. And we had a big hole in ours. So we knew how to spin the blood mm. quickly and do the PCR. But then there was a manual process for extracting the DNA that was going to take 25 or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I kind of left it alone. I figured, well, we'll get an answer there when, you know, when we come to it and turns out they have a technology that can do it potentially in five minutes costs like $10 and speed up the whole process. So mm -hmm. a challenge, you know, became a, a win, you know, through the journey. That's great. And those are the sorts of challenges I hear about all the time from our companies, corporate organization, things, competition. Sometimes you don't know if a product is competing with you or not. And then to see right. one turn out to be an opportunity is just really a, a stroke of luck. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, so let's talk about the startup ecosystem a little bit. You mentioned the uh, Entrepreneurship and Investor Life Sciences Summit. And I saw you and Devin present there and it was great. And uh, just mm -hmm. like you said, a lot of people in the audience were raising their hands saying, yeah, I know people who have suffered with sepsis. The uh, I feel like Bio Utah is a, a real force for good in, in Utah. Kelvin Colomar is doing a great job with it. How, yeah. how has that been for you? Have you made connections here and how hard has it been to do that? It's uh, so... We got the technology, I think, September, October, the year before, and they had something. And so I just went just to, you know, expose myself to it. I knew a few people in the industry, um, but got to know Kelvin and, you know, the relationship. And, and in Utah, I think we have a, a an attitude of helping others. You know, that's mm -hmm. what we do. And whether it's in SaaS or med tech. And so we've gotten some introductions. And yeah, now what I go there, it's like, I know a lot of the key players and, and talking to them and saying, Hey, you're doing a great job there. You know, I hope you have success. So at this event, over 30 companies had applied to present. And these aren't all just startups. These are companies that have been doing right. things for a while and have five, 10 million or more in funding. And so we got picked out of the over plus 30, there was nine that presented and I got some feedback from some judges and it looks like we came in a close third uh, to right. the other BYU technology yeah. um, that, uh, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Uh, Bloom um, Surgical. Yep. Bloom Surgical. So they did a good job. And so I felt strong, like, hey, we've got something really special here and people are recognizing it. And it's just our job to get it out there more and, and get accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thought your explanation of the technology in that presentation, well, and here too, was really good. 
The um, I think people should know when you're talking about spinning the sample, that's very precise spinning, right? Like it's a uh, oh, yeah exact timing, and it's it's exact. Yeah, Doctor Pitt, and so he he. I'm sorry, I don't have the sample, but he okay. he played around with different sizes of the disc, and you know he went to like 16 centimeters or 10 centimeters and 12, and the 12 one just works perfect. We have a process patent. So somebody can't get around this by changing the design a little, you know, it's basically the, the, the physical or the, the scientific things that are going on there uh, that make it what it's so special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so intellectual property strategy, hugely important for your company, right? And it's clear yeah. from your comments, you've thought through that a lot. Yeah. And we'll be adding some more patents it, because we came in a little late, later on the sepsis technology we didn't get the opportunity to do international patents on it. So the new things that we patent, we're going to do international. So it protects us. Um, we're trying to do a, a joint venture with Seek Labs and their stuff is brand new, just patented. And I imagine they're going for worldwide patents. So if we have a partnership with them, I think it strengthens our, our case even more. And sometimes our software companies, especially really technical ones like this in the life sciences, are a little scared about the patenting landscape on the, on the front end. But I think what you're suggesting is as you go along, you're going to continue to make innovations. There are going to be more opportunities to patent. So the fact that maybe someone didn't optimize their first filing isn't, isn't necessarily a deal killer, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I understand why BYU doesn't do it on everything until they have somebody that is going to be right. taking it and commercializing it. But uh, a funny story. So, um, so we licensed some other technology from you guys, from Doctor Jonathan Hill. We are now calling it the Leucine Lock uh, technology, and it's a think of it as a cross of a rapid sepsis, a rapid antigen test, and a PCR. So, the antigen test is fast, but it's not very accurate. But it's cheap, and a PCR takes a little bit longer, very accurate, but more expensive. So he came up with this idea of like taking an antigen test and having it amplify the signal. And we've got a US patent and worldwide patents on it. And we think it's gonna take, you know, a standard antigen test gets about 75-ish, you know, accuracy which is okay. Um, but you did get a lot of false positives with those, but we think we might get up in the 90 percentile with that technology. And we can detect bacteria, viruses, anything with a protein. He's super excited about it for like insulin. So for insulin, one of the other, his cohorts uh, said that there's probably a billion people in the world that are pre-diabetes and they don't know it. So we believe we might be able to have this technology, take a blood sample, run it, and it wouldn't be very expensive, and they could find out if their insulin levels are off. So and if you discover that, is there then some action you can take so you don't develop actual diabetes? Yes, yeah, that's the, the key. Is like before you're full-blown diabetic, if you know you're starting to, then there's things you can do health-wise, eating-wise, that can hopefully, you know, cut it off from, you know, progressing. So, yeah. So there's a ton of opportunities there, but while I was talking to him um, about his technology, I was prompted twice to ask him about, oh, are we getting close on time here? Nope. You're good. You're good. Um, I was prompted to ask him twice about like, I saw some other companies in the industry that were taking some sepsis information using AI and, and uh, you know, big data to potentially get an answer for antimicrobial susceptibility testing, which is the second part of the diagnosis is one, identify the pathogen, two is tell the doctor what antibiotic to give them, what level as far as the dosage and things like that. And so it's the holy grail of infectious disease. and. No, nobody's been able to do it very quick. You know, they, they take many days for both of them. Um, and I asked him, I said, you know, could, is that something we could do? And he first time said, no, I, I felt prompted to ask him again the second time. And 
And he says, no, I don't think so. But he says, well, how are you doing? Because he, he didn't really understand the sepsis technology from Dr. Pitt and Robinson. And I told him his blood samples, qPCR. And then he started to think for a second. And he thought, you know, we might, I might have a solution for that. <laughs> it's like, really? He says, yeah, if, if it works, it'd probably take 45 minutes. And this other company that's raised 80, 90 million, they're trying to get an answer to those two questions in under eight hours. Huh. If it works and we'll know in about two months, at least a proof of concept, I think we'll do it under two hours, hmm. which is really groundbreaking and hmm. good for everybody and, you know, should be good for the business as well. So, you know, following promptings of the spirit, Mm -hmm. is is really key whether it's in your personal life or business life mm -hmm. and that's so true and there's also a, a connection there so you had the industry experience to know what the problem was and then we have these people on campus jonathan hill is a prolific inventor like he's a really bright guy and so right. just communicating that question to him gave him a chance to to do some valuable invention right yeah sometimes it's you know um putting you know seeing something different than you know what everybody else is you know Einstein has a quote, it's like creativity is looking at something that everybody else sees and coming up with an answer that nobody else does. So, um, you know, I believe God allows us to, you know, create things out of the materials he's given us to help mankind. And um, yeah, it's great working with the professors. I love all of them and they're very helpful. And um, we're going to be doing some research agreements with BYU to, you know, improve enhance the the testing as you know yeah and we've had like, on the professor side of it too like i've had numerous professors over the years tell me that they felt inspired to to solve a problem in a certain way and um mm -hmm. definitely seeing god's hand in that too and directing their research efforts here so appreciate yeah. it so you have so you're working on the technology you have um all these issues to deal with among other things you have to set up a company and create a, a culture and hire hire some smart people uh, how mm -hmm. what's your approach to all of those issues so, um, you know, we originally set up uh, LLCs, they, they were simple and easy, but when you get into the venture capital investment market, you got to have uh, Delaware C-Corps. And so recently, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, set up two new ones and, you know, all the paperwork and, you know, dotting every I, crossing the T and then getting it set up in Utah was a lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. But Devin Connor, like I said, he's my right hand man. I couldn't have done this without him. We did bring a, a gentleman over, and I think I've told you about him a couple of times, who was a CEO, had a couple of exits from SaaS companies. Really good guy, really knowledgeable, good connections, but he never he never felt comfortable in the med tech industry and and felt uncomfortable saying like, yeah, we want to raise money, but we don't have any, we're not making any money now, but we will maybe in a year or two, you know? Right. And so um, we're still going to probably do something with them, with our software, with him down the road. But um, we made some changes. We got introduced to some industry experts um, that have taken stuff through FDA approval, have run big companies, know how to market. And they're our advisors right now. We hope to bring them on maybe full time. Um, and this is a small world. Mike Alder, son, Matt Alder, sure. specializes in uh, neonatal sepsis. And so we've talked with him over the years and just recently he's agreed to come on as our chief medical officer advisor and he's helping us, you know, on that front. So bringing in really good people, the professors um, are doing well, they're helping out and um, we're working with them to uh, really get this to market and save a lot of lives. So it's, it's very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. And time and time again. Yeah, that that expertise and getting through the FDA process is just so important, right? For life sciences company, it's um, yeah. that's an issue that recurs. And knowing what it is, because I think we're a class two device, and we we're going to do a five ten k, and based on our understanding that we know, and some of the people that are advising us, we're going to do a breakthrough device, and it's the a breakthrough is like something really unique and revolutionary in the industry, and there's, there's four other criteria, and it's like you know, diagnosis, how fast the diagnosis, the cost and something else. And like, we have three out of four. Um, so we really will do it much faster than the current competition, which, you know, is good. Cause I'd love to take this to 
you know, third world countries, Africa and other people that it's a huge, huge problem. You know, every day doctors are dealing with sepsis, but if we can give them the right tools. Hopefully that will go down quite a bit. Oh, fantastic. So great. Well, so you um, you're addressing a hard entrepreneurial problem here and, and dealing well with all these issues. Uh, some of our life sciences students here will be watching this and they'd like to start a startup company sometime. What would be your advice for young entrepreneurs? Um, you know, it's going to take a lot of uh, diligence, resilience, um, partner with good people, you know, get right people working with you, whether it's uh, professors. I know a lot of I've seen your people come out and work with professors and industry experts. Um, and so, yeah, just associate with the right people. Um, I'd be happy to mentor, you know, people. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for new technology potentially that we could help with or, you know, introduction, introductions to the right people I'd be happy to do as well. Appreciate it. Well, thanks, Brian. And then uh, for the company for Diagnostic Ventures, uh, to the extent you, you're able to say like five years from now, what's the vision? Like, where, where do you think you're headed? So um, we think we'll have FDA approval maybe, you know, the fourth quarter of next year, no later than, you know, 2026. And by all observations, we've, we're talking to hospitals. We're talking to the innovation funds at those hospitals. They a large hospital loses 34 million a year because of the unexpected costs with sepsis patients. So it's a win-win. If they fund us and we can get it done faster, they're going to have less money lost and life saved. So I, I think we can really take the market. I, I think our projections are conservative. We're just looking at the U S market, but this is a worldwide problem. So in the U S there's currently 50 million blood cultures done a year at our levels of, you know, uh, th three years down the road, we're looking at less than 2 million and we're still very profitable at 2 million. We're like uh, 129 million in revenue and decent profit. So I think it's going to go very well if we can do the AST stuff as well. I, I think we're a billion plus dollar company and uh, yeah. Yeah. I think we'd be acquired by a major player or something like that and be good for us and good for BYU. Yeah, that's right. And we're so grateful to have people like you, Brian, out there taking these technologies, especially these ones that are life-saving. They're just really going to make a difference for people all over the world and getting them out where people can use them. So thanks for that. And thanks for your time today. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you about this. Yeah. Uh, love working with you guys. Anything I can do to help. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot, Brian.